Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're familiar with my journey into concealed carry and firearms, you'll know that I do not grow up around guns. I started learning about them as an adult, so everything that I was learning was brand new to me. I had questions that I was too embarrassed to ask in like a class and stuff, and you might be in a similar situation where you have a question that you're too embarrassed to ask. And I know a lot of people say there's no such thing as a dumb question, and I firmly believe that. I think it's better to ask and get an answer, even if it's embarrassing, than to just bury your question and it's never going to get answered and you'll never know the answer. So I asked you guys both in my email list and on my Instagram for your embarrassing gun questions, things you're too ashamed to ask. Um, I even made a way for you guys to ask me anonymously in case you were too embarrassed to ask with me knowing who sent the question. And I got hundreds of responses. A lot of them were more in-depth questions, a lot of questions about how guns work, the mechanics behind guns, and a lot of those things are topics I cover in my Armed and Confident Academy, which is my do-it-yourself, at-home, online course. If you're interested in that, it's half off right now. I'll link it below. Just use the code EQUIPS50 to get 50% off when you enroll. But a lot of those questions about how guns work that help you understand guns in general are answered in my online course, as well as a lot of other topics. You can see the whole curriculum on the page that I'll link below. But the way I got the idea for this video is one of you sent me a question to my email, and it was a question that I've never received before, so it was one that I didn't think needed to be answered because the answer seemed obvious to me because I know the answer. So it made me wonder what other questions do you guys have that I might not think to answer. I'll probably have to do this video in two parts, so this might be part one of my two-part video answering your embarrassing questions. But I'm going to answer the first question right now because it's a good one and it's really important to know if you carry a gun. The question is, how do I load 11 rounds in a 10 round magazine. When they say a gun's capacity is, for example, 10 plus one, what is the plus one? If you're wondering this, or you've never heard it, I'm about to blow your mind. All right, let's use my shield for an example. This is my Smith & Wesson Shield Plus. It's a nine millimeter handgun. Here's the magazine, okay. I live in Massachusetts, so I'm restricted to 10 rounds makes no sense, but whatever, you might also be. So I'm just going to use a 10 round magazine for an example, but this can go for any capacity plus one. So this magazine holds 10 rounds in it. So you fill up the 10 rounds, okay? Now this part is where it's important to know how semi-automatics operate. To show you guys how this works, I'm not going to use live rounds. I'm going to use snap caps, and these ones are made by Otis. There we go. So you can see it says 9mm on there. This is not a live round. These are used for training, for practice. I've got five of them here. I recently did a video using Otis products to clean my husband's duty gun. I will link that up here in case you guys want to check it out. But Otis makes excellent cleaning products, but they don't only have cleaning products. They also have things like this, snap caps you can use when you practice at home. Whether you're just doing dry fire in your home, you can use these. Um, I like that they're red so you won't get them like, confused with anything else. Uh, you can use them at the range. I like to do like a ball and dummy drill to practice my trigger control. Things like this, what I'm about to show you right now with the magazine. Even practice just loading a magazine, you can use these. So lots of good uses for snap caps if you don't have them yet. I do have a, I think it's a 15% discount. Uh, I'll check that and link it below for you guys if you want to buy any Otis products. But get some snap caps that are in your caliber for your gun and you can practice all sorts of stuff. So I'm going to use these snap caps right now to show you what 10 plus 1 means or X plus 1. Your magazine capacity. This holds 10 rounds, okay? I'm not going to load 10 snap caps in it, but I'm just going to load a few. So say I've loaded all 10 rounds, okay? This now has 10 rounds in it. When I go to load my gun, based on the way semi-automatics work, I'm going to insert the magazine. Now you can see the first round of the magazine is right there at the top. 
In order to chamber that round, the slide needs to go forward. So I'm gonna take my slide, and I have a whole video on the easiest way to do this. If you have grip strength if issues, or you find it hard to rack the slide on a gun, I will link that here. It's my most popular video. I'm so glad so many of you found it helpful. But the way I do it is I just grab the slide and slingshot it, let it go. Okay, so now what happened inside is that it took the round off the top of the magazine and chambered it. Which means that if I remove my magazine now, how many rounds are in my magazine? Nine. So then I take my plus one round, put it in the magazine, insert it in the firearm, now I have 10 rounds in the magazine plus one in the chamber. So that's how you can carry 11 rounds. And if your state has magazine restrictions like mine does and you can only have 10 round magazines, this is totally legal. You can have a 10 round magazine plus one in the chamber, technically you're carrying 11 rounds. If you have a 13 round magazine or a six round magazine, you do the exact same thing, but then it would be six plus one or a 13 plus one, whatever plus one, you have that extra round in here. So when you're gonna carry a firearm, you want to carry as many rounds as you possibly can. So instead of just loading 10 rounds in your magazine, you can load that extra round, chamber it, carry it like that. And I do recommend carrying with a round in the chamber. It's another thing I talk about in the Armed and Confident Academy. And I talk you through the steps to get comfortable with that as well. That way you can have the most capacity in your carry gun. All right, I'm gonna try to answer the rest of them quicker because there's a lot of questions. Okay, when unloading a semi-auto, I remove the magazine and rack the slide to eject the round from the chamber. Is that round now damaged or can I load it back into the magazine? So in general, if you're gonna unload your firearm, so say, say this is loaded, I've got that dummy round in here again. Um, to unload it, I'm gonna remove the magazine. And now when I rack the slide, this round's gonna pop out. Okay, here's the round that I ejected. In general, you can just load that back into your magazine again, but something that can happen is something called bullet setback, which is when the bullet, this whole thing is not a bullet, the projectile's the bullet, but that's when the bullet gets set back in the casing, and that can happen. You can just look at it, check it against the other ones, make sure that they're the same height and that that bullet hasn't become set back because that is something that can happen. But generally, yeah, it's okay to use that round again. It's probably not damaged. Just take a look at it, make sure that it looks okay. And you might just want to put it lower in the magazine and put a fresh round in the chamber. That's an option. The next question is what is trigger reset? If you've seen any of my gun reviews, I talk about trigger reset. I'm just gonna show you in a really simple way, I'm not gonna complicate this, what trigger reset is. All right, I'm just zooming in on the gun here so you guys can see what trigger reset is. Say I'm gonna fire my gun. I'm gonna fire one round, so I got my finger on the trigger, I pull the trigger to the rear, and the gun goes bang. To fire another round, the slide's gonna come back, go forward, I'm just gonna crack my slide to simulate that. My finger is still all the way to the rear. So in order to fire again, my finger's gonna have to come out, I'm gonna hear a click, and then I can pull the trigger again and fire another shot. So trigger reset is basically how far forward the trigger has to go before you can fire another shot. So I'm still pulling it all the way back. I'm gonna start letting it go, releasing it, and then you're gonna hear a little click, and then I can fire again. So this is the distance that I have to move my finger before I can fire another shot. So here we go. Okay, there's the click, and I can fire again, okay? So now if I just let it go all the way forward, that's how far forward it goes. But my reset is right there. Now I can pull the trigger again, rather than coming all the way out and then firing again. So that just allows you to shoot faster if you like to use trigger reset. Um, that's basically what that means. I had to get a prop for this next question. Okay, this next question is one that I think is so important and I really wanted to answer it because if you're wondering this, it's very important that you know how to answer it. Okay, do I have to pull the trigger? That's the question. If I'm in fear for my life and pull my gun on the attacker, once I do, if they flee or I'm no longer fear in fear for my life, do I have to shoot? Maybe this is different or varies by law, but I've never understood what this would look like or what my options would be. Okay. Whoever sent this in, I'm so glad you asked this question. First, I wanna say that I always preach to you guys that you need to take a use of force class that's relevant to your state's laws 
because the laws in each state vary. And also, before you start carrying around a lethal tool, you need to know when you can and cannot use it. One resource that I love to share with you guys in this regard is this book, The Law of Self-Defense. It's by attorney Andrew Branca. This book is excellent in explaining the law of self-defense, and it also has a huge index in the back that you can look at, you can find your state and the exact law that applies to whatever situation you're looking into, like duty to retreat, um, when deadly force is justified, there's these huge tables that go through the law. So take a class as well, but also have this as a resource. Look up your state's use of force laws. They all have them online. So I'm just gonna say, my answer to this question is no. You don't have to shoot, and in fact, there are many times when you shouldn't shoot based on the situation. And these situations are changing constantly. And your force, your reaction, is supposed to be based on what's happening at that exact moment in time. So for example, if someone's running at me with a knife and I draw my gun on them, and they drop the knife, should I then shoot them? Where's the threat of death or serious bodily harm? Their ability's gone. My life is no longer in imminent jeopardy. So there are certain things that need to be met before you can use lethal force, and it's important for you to understand that. So no, when you draw a gun, that doesn't mean that you have to pull the trigger. And if you cannot, that's great. You don't wanna have to pull the trigger unless you have to. So know your use of force laws. Love this book. I'm gonna link it below so that you guys can read it. It's not that long. The whole back part is like an index. So the actual front part is not a terribly long read, but definitely recommend it. Do you ever feel the need to ask a family member or friend if they're comfortable with you carrying in their home? Or do you just carry it and not even bring it up? Even if they know, I'm sorry, even if you know, they know, you carry. If they don't bring it up, why would I bring it up, you know? Especially if they don't know that you carry, your gun is probably going to be concealed in a way where they wouldn't know. Um, if they've expressed to you that they don't want you carrying in their home, then that's different. It's their home. Maybe just invite them to your house next time. I don't know. But I wouldn't bring it up. I don't see the reason to bring it up. Like, it's just not necessary in my opinion. You're gonna have to judge that based on the person and how well you know them and the specific situation. I would still carry unless they explicitly asked me not to. It's their house, so I'd have to figure out something else. Maybe just not go there um, or figure something out. But no, I wouldn't tell them. When I carry, I'm always afraid that my gun will be printing too well, that people will see it or it will fall out of the holster. So for you guys who don't know what printing is, that's when your gun shows through your clothing. Like you have a t-shirt over your gun and it, you can see the guns outlined through it. I know a lot of people worry about printing when they first start to carry and then as they continue even. Um, I'm not as paranoid about this anymore because I just find that people don't notice much going on around them. I think that sometimes I could probably open carry and nobody would see it. Not that I recommend that, but people are just not paying attention usually to what's going on around them. Um, but I know that in the beginning when you start carrying a gun, you might be a little paranoid about this. And it's also not a good tactic to let other people know that you have a gun. You want to you wanna conceal that little thing. So I understand the concern with printing. It might even be illegal where you live. I don't know. Check your laws. Um, finding a way to conceal a gun on your body is kind of what I do here a lot. <laughs> I have a lot of videos on showing you guys different ways to carry, so that's something that I focus on a lot. And it all comes down to like your body shape, where to find space on your body, and there are so many different ways to conceal a gun. It's crazy. When people, if people do see that you have a gun on you, especially if you live in a state like Massachusetts where I am, people are not comfortable around guns and they might call the cops or something even though it's totally legal for me to carry one and even for them to be seeing it. But it's just that fear that people have. So it might cause some inconvenience for me if the cops come, I have to go through all that. Not doing anything illegal, but that is an issue. So check out different ways that you can carry according to your body type. You might have to change up the way you dress. I don't really subscribe to that. I like to dress the way that I dress and I carry around that and you'll see that in a lot of my videos so check out some of my videos if you need ideas on how to carry i don't know 
if you're a male or a female asking this question, what your body type is, but um, as far as it falling out of the holster, that should not happen. You should not carry in a way where the gun can fall out of the holster. Um, there are lots of different holsters out there. Find one where the gun will not fall out. And you can also just modify your holsters in a way that won't allow the gun to fall out. So make sure your gun doesn't fall out of your holster. Retention is important. Alright guys, that's going to conclude part one of this video. This is getting kind of long, so I'm going to cut it short and do a part two. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to check out the Army Confident Academy below and anything else I mentioned. I'll link it all in the description of this video. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Stay safe. Bye.